we're in a study entitled, The Teachings of Jesus. And um, what we're, we're not doing a chronological study. We're not just looking at a gospel per se. Uh, we're looking at some of the teachings of Jesus that are a little bit unique, a little bit obscure. Um, teachings that we don't examine very often. And uh, just trying to focus on some of the lessons and some of the things that we learn from those. And last week we began a study of the triumphal entry. How many gospel writers make mention of the triumphal entry? Okay, yes, I got one, four, two fours. Yes, there were four, all four gospel writers. Now John is an interesting study because he only includes about four verses with regard to the triumphal entry. Whereas Matthew has 11, and uh, the other writers uh, go into more detail. So John's kind of a unique uh, uh, entry when it comes to the triumphal entry. When we talk about triumphal entry, what in the world are we talking about? Triumphal entry. What is that? Okay, yes. Uh, Jesus had told his disciples to go get a donkey. When they got a donkey, they brought it back. He uh, sat upon that donkey, and uh, he had uh, their clothing was laid upon it. Also, they laid clothes, and they also laid palm leaves and palm branches in front of him as he made his entrance into what? The city of Jerusalem. Okay, And so uh, he was announcing to the world what? Y'all are just kind of mumbling, you know. I hear it. Okay, uh, what's he announcing to the world? Yeah, that I am the King of the Jews. I am the Messiah that you have been waiting for. True or false? This event was a fulfillment of prophecy. Yes. And who brought this prophecy to pass? Jesus did. Now that's unique, folks. Okay, uh, sometimes his enemies brought prophecies to pass. Sometimes his friends brought prophecies to pass. But in this instance, Jesus himself made certain that this prophecy came to pass. Question. Had there ever been occasions in times past when Jesus could have been made king by the Jews and he refused? Yeah. Uh, they, they wanted to immediately grab him and exalt him to the position of the king of the Jews, and yet he would walk away. Question, why now? Why now is he so interested in showing the world he's a king? Yes, yes. Folks, Jesus came to this earth, and he was on a time frame, was he not? And he knew exactly what that time scale was. And Jesus would not allow anything to transpire until the time was exactly right. Okay? They tried to uh, exalt Him as King. They tried to uh, go out and announce Him to the world. And He'd tell them, no, my hour has not yet come. It's not time yet. But when the time was come, guess what? Jesus held nothing back, did He? Here's another question. Is Jesus' kingdom of this world? Man. Now this is weird to me. Okay? And this is why I picked this topic. Okay? Does the triumphal entry seem to indicate that Jesus is about to establish an earthly kingdom? Okay, I got one. Yes, it does. Way down here in the front. Okay? Now remember, Jesus said, John 1836, my kingdom is not of this world. He told that to Pilate, did he not? And yet, here you have this physical event. He gets on a donkey. He parades himself into the city of Jerusalem. Individuals are all around him. Wouldn't you like to see the throngs of people that were there? Folks, they've been anticipating this for years, haven't they? The Jews knew the prophecy of Zechariah. They also knew of other prophecies about this coming king. And now all of a sudden, on this Sunday, he allows himself to be brought into the city of Jerusalem. Individuals are surrounding him, screaming out, God save the king. And yet, 
He never intended to build an earthly kingdom. Larry? If he was going to have to be an earthly king, he wouldn't have ridden in on a donkey. He'd been on a white horse. Possibly. Okay. Possibly. But it was still a very physical act, wasn't it? And you, you would think that the, the people would um, be thinking, oh, here he comes, right? It's about to happen. He's going to go into the city of Jerusalem and he's going to overthrow the Roman government and he's going to establish this kingdom. Surely that's what he's going to do. And yet he never had that intent in mind. So the question that we are asking and trying to get a little bit of a grasp on is why did he do this then? Why would he do a physical act to announce a spiritual kingdom? Okay. So, so, but, but why such a physical act? Okay. It. Okay. And that that's true. But, but why such a physical act when your kingdom is not of this world? Does that make... Am I getting the question across? You know? In other words, everybody who sees what's going on, in their mind, they already think the kingdom is going to be physical, don't they? The Jews had a wrong interpretation of the kingdom. They thought it was going to be a literal, real kingdom with the throne being in the city of Jerusalem, just like premillennialists do today. Okay? And so here Jesus is, gets on this donkey, rides into town, looking like who? Here I am, your king, and yet I'm not going to establish a physical kingdom though. Why such a physical act? Okay, we mentioned that one last time, wasn't it? To fulfill prophecy. Turn in your Bibles. And, and guys, th there, there's no real answer to this question, to be honest. Other than the one Larry just gave. To fulfill prophecy. God said that if you're the Messiah, that you will come into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey and with his foal beside him. Isn't that true? So the fulfillment of prophecy is enough to do it because that's God's will, isn't it? But again, it still makes you wonder, why such a physical act for something that is spiritual in nature? Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul makes some interesting statements in this particular chapter. <clears throat> Look at verse 10 beginning. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now guys, I want you to keep something in mind right here. Okay? In order for me to be saved, I have to what? I have to love the truth. Okay? If I don't receive the love of the truth then I will not be saved. That's what Paul's talking about in this text. Now look at the very next verse. And for this cause, okay, because they will not receive the truth, God does what? And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a what? A lie. I have for years, scratched my head, tried to think of examples of 
strong delusions that God would send people because they won't believe what? The truth. And I'm finally, at least in my mind, I may not in your mind, I'm finally in my mind beginning to see some. Okay? Genesis 1. How many days did it take God to create the world? Six days. Right? That's what the Bible says. You turn over to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. In six days God created the heavens and the earth, the seas, and all that in them is. You either believe that or what? Or you don't. Now, are there many who don't? Oh yes. Guess what God's done? God has sent a strong delusion to these people. You want to know where it is? It's in the crust of the earth. Isn't it? Individuals go there. They study the, 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 you know, the strata of the earth. They study the fossils. They study all this stuff. They say, aha, see there? Evolution is true, not Genesis 1. If you will not receive the love of the truth, God will do what? He will send you a strong delusion that you should believe a lie. What do the Jews believe? The Jews believe that the kingdom is going to be a physical kingdom. Didn't they? And they also believed that it was going to be a man, not the Son of God, who sat upon that throne in the city of Jerusalem. Because the Jews are holding to this error about a physical kingdom, guess what God does? God sends them a strong delusion. He sends them a king riding in on a physical donkey as if he's going to be the one who takes the physical throne in Jerusalem. But it was never, ever the will of God that that come to pass. Can you imagine after doing that particular event... And then you announce to the world, well, you know, my kingdom is not of this world though. <laughs> well, you're sure not the king we want. And guess what, folks? Less than one week later, they're crying out to a king, aren't they? And they're crying almost the same words, God save the king! But here's what they say, if he be a king, let him come down from the cross. Isn't that amazing? How in less than five days, here is a nation of people who think the Messiah is here. The Messiah is coming. And then they reject him and put him up on the cross of Calvary. Why? Because they believed what? A strong delusion, a lie rather than believing the simple truth. You know what? Sometimes I wonder, see, I can't, I can't prove any of this. I, you know, and that, that's what's so hard, you know. I'm, I'm just giving you illustrations. The denominational world, does it look like sometimes and resemble very closely the church? Yeah. You know, individuals come to us and they see what we do here. Well, you, you gather on the first day of the week, right? You sing, we sing. You have the Lord's Supper. Oh yes, you do it every week, but we do it once a quarter, two times a year. We, but we do it, don't we? Uh, we? We give every week just like you do. And so, there's just little difference between us and you, they think. Right? And so, this rise of denominationalism appears to be a strong delusion. If you will not believe the truth about the oneness of the church as taught in the pages of God's Word, God will allow you to believe a strong delusion. Everybody's okay. Everybody's saved. All churches are just alike. We're all going to the same place in different ways. Just attend the church of your choice and everybody will be happy. That is a strong delusion, folks. And you believe that, it's a what? It's a lie. You see, I either love the truth or I love lies. It's that simple. Okay? And, and remember, lies are designed to be what? 
to deceive, to be deceptive. And guess who is the father of all lies? Satan. And guess what Satan doesn't want? He doesn't want you to be saved. He wants you to believe a lie. He wants you to be lost. He wants to rejoice in your misery. He wants to be down there fellowshipping you in hell. So I better be careful about what I believe. And see, that's why we take this book, isn't it? And I believe this book, regardless of what man says, regardless of what appears to be true, right? And I just believe what God says. Regardless of the mountain of what appears to be evidence to the contrary, I'm going to believe what God says. So that I will never ever be deceived. So could Jesus' riding in on this donkey be part of the strong delusion? That man would believe a lie. Here's our king coming. And yet a week later, he's on the cross of Calvary and dies. Unbelievable. How men can change their mind that fast, isn't it? What do we call that? We call that fickle. <laughs> Don't we? Just plum fickle. Now, that's all introduction. Okay? That's just introduction. Uh, we've already covered three points in this lesson, okay? And that's why if you have the new outline, uh, you'll see three points that are there. Uh, we covered those last week. So I want to touch on the second half of the lesson this week. Now remember, you can go onto our website and you can get last week's lesson that goes along with this one, okay? And uh, we're recording all of these, so they also go up on YouTube if you can tolerate watching who's presenting this. <laughs> Notice, first of all, we had what? The information, right? Then secondly, we had the... or First of all, we had the instructions that Jesus gave. Secondly, the prediction, the prophecy. And then the submission. The uh, disciples were told, go get the donkey. And what did they do? They went and got the donkey, okay? Now we enter into another section called adoration. And watch what transpires. And they brought him to Jesus. This is from Luke's Gospel, 35, uh, Luke 19, 35 through uh, 38. And they brought him to Jesus, that's the donkey. And they cast their garments upon the colt. And they sat Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Guys, this was not an unusual event. Okay? Um, when kings were exalted, when kings were exonerated, when kings took their place in the annals of history, guess what? There were always great celebrations that transpired. And I've given you a quote from a man by the name of Isaac Hull. David was welcomed by singing and dancing women out of all the cities of Israel as he came back from the slaughter of the Philistines. Herodotus records that when Xerxes passed over the bridge of the Hellespot, the way before him was strewn with branches of myrtle, while burning perfumes filled the air. Quintius Curtius tells of the scattering of flowers in the way before Alexander the Great when he entered Babylon. Monier saw the way of the per of Persian rulers strewn with roses for three miles, while glass vessels filled with sugar were broken under his horse's feet. Folks, these celebrations in that day were extremely common, okay? Here comes the king back from victory. Here comes the king that we're about to put into place as the new king over us. And guess what? There was great celebration. And now Jesus takes advantage of that, doesn't he? Yes, I am a king. Yes, I'm the king of the Jews. Yes, I'm the king who you've been looking for all these years, and Jesus allows them to say that 
all the way from the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem. Unbelievable. Why? Because it's time. Before this time, Jesus had never just come out boldly and said, I'm the king of Israel. Okay, he never, he never just said it boldly. But he's about to be brought in before Pontius Pilate, is he? He's about to be brought in before Caiaphas, the high priest. And guess what he's going to be asked by both of them? Are you the king of the Jews? And guess what he's going to say? I am. In our King James Version, sometimes it says this, Thou sayest it. Okay? And what he means by that is this. Okay? He says... What you are saying is true. I am the king of the Jews. Thou sayest it. So you see now, Jesus doesn't hesitate to tell these individuals exactly who I am. I am the king, the one you've been looking for all of this time. Now what's fun to do is go through the various gospels and watch the statements that are made by the people and, and there's a multitude of them, folks. Okay, We just read uh, Luke's Gospel. Well, let's look at Matthew's Gospel for just a minute. Matthew 21, 9. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed, he, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The word Hosanna literally means save now. It also could be translated. Save we pray it's like crying out, God save the king. Man, there's no doubt that Jesus is allowing himself to be announced. Notice that they says this, blessed, I mean, Hosanna to who? The son of David. Was Jesus the son of David? Did David have other sons? But is this statement different than the other ones? It is. is. Oh, there's a man bold enough to talk out. And that means when you talk out, you have to say, why is it? Well, in, in the case of Jesus being the son of David, that was uh, part of the prophecy that there would, that there would, would rise to the view of the son of David. David, as, as opposed to any of his other sons, that, that was not the case. That would, that would distinguish Christ from him, this Jesus from his other sons. Okay. Folks, one of the things that's very uh, uh, important in the Jewish history is this concept of the coming Messiah, right? Okay, it's very important. And uh, the thing that's laid down for us all the way from Abraham on is that Jesus would come through a specific lineage of people. Okay? He couldn't just be a Jew. He couldn't just be a Jew of any tribe. He couldn't just be a Jew of the tribe of Judah from any family in Judah. You see, the lineage was very, very specific. And he had to come from who? David. Now when the people are crying out, Jesus is the son of David. This is the king, the son of David. Folks, he is the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. This is the one who springs from the very loins of David himself. He is the Messiah, is what these people are saying. And there's no doubt, at least it appears right now, in their minds of that. Notice what else they say. Blessed is he that cometh, what? In the name of the Lord. What do they mean by that? In the name of the Lord. Yes, by the authority of the Almighty God. Folks, can you imagine what those people are saying that day? Just, just those three statements is enough, isn't it? He's the King, He's the Son of David, and He has come here by the authority of the Almighty God. Shoo! Powerful statements. Notice Mark's account. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now watch this next one. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now what are they talking about? And now they're talking about kingdom, aren't they? 
You see, folks, not only were they expecting a king, they were expecting a kingdom. Okay? If you're going to be a king, you better have a what? A kingdom. Okay? And so they also are anticipating this coming kingdom as well, and they acknowledge it in their praise of the Almighty that day. Notice what Luke says again. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory to the highest. John says this, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now who's shouting this? The people. Now, see, we say the people. And that's true. Okay, but the text says the multitude of the disciples. Would you love to have been there and seen how many? I'd love to have seen also how this crowd got generated, wouldn't you? I mean, Jesus is just by Himself with the disciples and tells them, hey guys, you know, go get me a donkey. And so they do, and it's just the disciples with Jesus right now. And all of a sudden, they're making their way from the Mount of Olives into town. And it's not that far. And before you know it, guess what's there? A ton of people. Okay? Just a multitude of people. All screaming and shouting, Hosanna to the highest! I mean, did it generate some controversy in Israel? Did it cause some stir? Yeah, we're going to see that before we get done. Okay? Notice the confrontation. Luke 19, 39 and 40. And some of, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto them, Master, rebuke thy disciples. What's their problem? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. They, the, the Pharisees didn't want this act going on, did they? What's their problem? Envy. Envy. That's a big one, wasn't it? You know, they'd they'd like to have one of themselves sitting on that donkey, wouldn't they? Okay. Any other problems? Okay, a loss of control over the people, right? So, So now rather than they being in the spotlight, who's in the spotlight? Jesus is in the spotlight, okay. Any other problems? They didn't authorize this event. You know, they were used directing everything, and that goes along with what he's saying, but specifically, they didn't authorize. That's right, yeah. They didn't authorize it, it shouldn't be happening. Okay, good. Yeah, they, these are the leaders. These, these are the Jewish people. I mean, these, these are the ones everybody looks to for guidance, and they're not in charge of this. Not one iota are they in charge of this, and have zero control over it, right? Now, they're trying to gain back a little control by talking to who? Talking to Jesus. Rebuke thy disciples. Unbelievable. Um, any other problems they have with this? Well, the three statements that... Go ahead. The three statements that were mentioned right there, they're basically saying that this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God. Okay. All right, yeah. See, here's an announcement that uh, He's the Messiah, He's the, the kingdom is coming, and did they believe that one iota? No. Folks, they, they didn't believe a thing of it. Not one thing did they believe about that. Did they believe Jesus is truly the son of David, the expected Messiah? No. We know his mama. We know his daddy. We know his brothers and sisters. We know where he was raised. We know he's just the carpenter's son. And look at him, sitting up there on that donkey. And everybody called him king. You need to shut these folks up. Can you imagine how mad those guys were? I wouldn't want to be around one. Would you? I just, I'm serious. These guys are angry, folks. Okay? But look what Jesus says. And he answered and said unto them, Okay, I'll tell them to be quiet. Is that what he said? No! Isn't it funny how Jesus just doesn't always go along with the religious leaders of the day? You know? He ticks them off, he offends them, and he tells them what? Oh, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. Now they tell him, hush up your disciples, and look what Jesus says. 
I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Isn't that amazing? Folks, even if the disciples decided to shut up, God would still have announced to the world at this very moment, what? The king is coming into Jerusalem. And he would have had his inanimate objects, the stones themselves, cry out the truth. Why? Because this was the what? This was the hour. And when God's hour comes, there is no changing it. Susan? Well, they, they definitely don't like it. You know, as, as far as what the actual relationship would be between Pilate and, and the Jewish leaders and this particular event, you know, I'm not certain. But they wouldn't want an uproar, you know. They, they don't want something that uh, Rome's going to have to come in and put down. That's for certain. You know, they wanted to, uh, they love the status quo. Keep everything just as quiet as they could. Um, man, we're not getting anywhere, are we? Drives me nuts. Look at Luke 19, 41 through 44. This is interesting to me. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. The lamentation. Now, folks, this is when he's what? He's not walking. He's riding on what? He's riding on the donkey. He gets to a place where he can see the city of Jerusalem. And guess what he knows in his mind? I'm the Messiah. I am the King. I am announcing it today and Friday I'll be on the cross of Calvary. And what does he do when he sees the city? He weeps over it. If thou hadst known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round about and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the, gro even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave one stone upon another because thou knowest not the time of thy salvation. What's Jesus talking about, folks? The destruction of the city of Jerusalem. You as a nation are rejecting me. Here's the day of your salvation. Here's the day when you ought to be embracing me as your king. And you're rejecting it. And what caused them to reject it, folks? Ignorance. Ignorance. It's the very thing that's going to cause multitudes to be lost in the last day. Your eyes are blinded. Truths are hidden from your mind. And guess what? Because of that, Jerusalem will suffer destruction in A.D. 70. And Jesus predicts it again, doesn't He? He's predicted it in the past. Watch one more thing real quick. This comes from Matthew's Gospel. And when He was coming to Jerusalem, all the city moved saying, Who is this? Folks, it was a stir. Not only were the Pharisees stirred, the whole city was stirred. And listen to how they answer. And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Uh, was Nazareth a well-respected town? Not too respected. This is just that prophet of Nazareth. Or, this is the prophet of Nazareth who you reject, but who is what? The true king of kings. Unbelievable. Just an interesting, interesting uh, passage. Next week we're going to be looking at John 1, 1 through 18. Okay, John 1, 1 through 18. It's referred to as the prologue of John's gospel. Very interesting uh, passage. In fact, the rest of our studies will probably come from John's gospels. There's a lot in there and we'll look at three or four passages. Thank you.